Welcome back to my channel. So ever since the start of my YouTube channel, I've been receiving a lot of different questions all about exchanges and how to sign up for exchange and just all these questions about exchange. Now I have watched some of these videos on YouTube but um, most of them I feel like they only tell you guys how to sign up for exchange but they don't tell you anything else. So, so today I'm going to be telling you guys everything you need to know about exchange from signing up to packing your host family's host school. Alright so this video is going to be a little bit lengthy but you guys wanted it so here it is. By the way if you guys are wondering, change of background because I'm in Maltes right now. I'm filming outside so if there's any background noises please don't mind that. I'll show you guys around. There's the ocean. I'm not too sure if you guys can see it. Anyways, back to the video. Alright so I'll be going through everything in a chronological order so if there's any specific topic that you guys are interested in feel free to skip ahead I'll leave all the annotations and timings down in the description bar below so remember to check that out and like always I hope you guys enjoyed this video and if you find this video helpful in any way please give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to hit the subscribe button down there and let's get started first off I just want to say that this video is mainly for cultural exchanges so meaning that you don't actually study when you go on exchange so it's mostly going to experience the culture and learning the language basically so if you're looking into more of an academic sort of exchange I suggest personally signing up with JET program or actually enrolling in a university rather than going on exchange all right first up signing up for exchange now there is a standard criteria that is stated on the website itself in my case I'm going to be using AFS as an example number one no health conditions meaning you have to be healthy and strong healthy basically number two you have to be adaptable you have to be easily adaptable to different culture differences, religions, stuff like that. And number three, you have to at least have a pass in all of your subjects in order to be eligible for going on exchange. That's what it's stated on the website, but honestly, I think you can fail like one or two. Doesn't matter. I failed two. Didn't really matter. So the first step you have to do is to actually pick an exchange company. In this video, I'm mainly going to be talking about AFS, but there are many, many different programs out there. There's AFS, of course. There's YFU, ASSE, CIE, Green Heart Travel, Rotary, and Jet Program, which is mainly for airplanes. Jet Program, which is mainly for university teaching when it comes to teaching English. Different companies will have different criteria in order to become an exchange student. For companies like CIEE, you have to have at least two years of formal study in the language that your host country speaks. Step two is to pick a program. There are many different types of programs. There's the intensive program, which is about less than a month, probably about three weeks. And then there's also a short-term program, which can last from a month all the way till half a year, so about six months and then of course there's the year program which was the one that I was in and that one was about 10 to 11 months and of course the prices will vary depending on how long you're gonna be staying for AFS prices can range all the way from $10,000 to $15,000 so it is a little bit pricey but you are paying for a lot of different things not just the program itself AFS pays for all your flight tickets to and from your host country AFS also covers your medical insurance so you don't have to worry about that AFS also covers your visa and any sort of AFS related activities like the summer camp and of course your host family and host school as well. Now what is not included? Well the flight from your hometown all the way to the meeting point. That flight is not covered of course and also your expenses will not be covered as well. Also if you're planning to go on a school trip and that's not covered as well, you have to pay by yourself. For those of you who feel that AFS is a bit too expensive for you or you will never be able to afford it, AFS do provide scholarships for students all over the world. So, so, oh gosh. So you can try to apply for a scholarship. There are half scholarships and full scholarships available. But I do want to say that scholarships are usually given to students who are really, really smart or, gosh, or, 
students whose parents have an income that's lower than average. All right, so once you've decided on the program that you want to go with, the first thing that you have to do is to go onto their website and click the little apply button that they have there. It will take you to this page and you will have to fill out an online application. It is really simple. It basically asks for your name, your age, your address. Once you're done with that, just send it back to the company in in about two to three weeks or even a month even, you will be called down for an interview. Now in some countries there will be an AFS volunteer um, who will come to your house and give you an interview but in some other countries you have to meet up at a spot with other AFSers and go for the interview. The interview itself it is mostly like a casting audition so um, there will be a table with judges and no cameras of course but there will be a chair and that's how they're gonna interview you. Questions they ask will vary depending on where you're from. Questions like why did you pick Japan or why should AFS pick you? How would you react in this sort of situation? In a case like if your host dad did something to you. If you're a Muslim and they offer you uh, pork or something or a food that's not um, halal, what would you do in a case like that? And that's pretty much it for the interview. So yeah, if you are chosen, you will be notified via email probably about two to three months later and you will also get a really huge bulky package consisting of your full application. The full application is pretty tedious, I'm not gonna lie, but um, it's alright, I think. You will have to state your host family preferences. Stuff like, are you okay with a family who has a different religion from you? Or, are you okay with pets or a dad who smokes? Or stuff like that. And also your dietary needs, if you are vegan or vegetarian or lactose intolerant, things like that, you have to state. You also have to get medical reports, so you have to go to your doctors, get your doctor's signatures, stuff like that. You also have to get a letter from your school, teachers letters, school letters, parents letters, dental appointments especially for those of you who have braces. And there will be a section for you where you have to write a letter to your host family. It has to be written in your host country's language so for me it was in Japanese so you have to write a letter in Japanese talking about yourself to your host family and then once you're done with all that package it back together and send it back to the company and we're on to the next step. Alright so the next step is probably the worst part because you have to wait for a really 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 long time. In most cases you probably have to wait about a year to a year and a half to get any sort of information from them. If you're lucky you might get news in about a week or two but um we're not lucky most of the time. So yeah, and don't be upset if you haven't heard any news from them yet because most exchange students only receive news about their host families and their host school like about a week before they depart. So don't worry too much about that. The last step of signing up on exchange or becoming an exchange student is when you receive details of your host families and your host school. I'll explain more about host families and host school later on but right now the moment you receive all this information you can start sending them emails asking them what they like sort of like getting to know them a little bit better first before you actually meet them. Next Packing. Now this is usually the part where you're all really excited to go and start your new life in Japan and all. But before that you have to pack, alright? You have to pack. Like you're going for a year abroad, like what do you bring? Well, for starters, ditch all of your fancy clothes and all of your hair tools because trust me, you will not be needing them at all. For me personally, I suggest bringing just the following. A couple of tops, a couple of buttons, some travel size toiletries. If you're a girl, bring sanitary pads or tampons because they do not have tampons in Japan. One universal adapter, your passport and your cards, identification cards and all. Your phone, your charger, your camera to take photos and pictures, your shoes, money, laptop and of course your host gifts. And some of you guys also ask me how much money to bring on exchange. I recommend bringing at least a thousand dollar cash and maybe an ATM card in case you want to withdraw any money yet. Next, your departure and your arrival. So it is time for you to depart. So say your last goodbyes and get ready to take off. So when you're in Japan, there will be an arrival orientation in Tokyo. So you will be able to meet AFSs from all over the world. There's people from Australia, Germany, Denmark, France, Thailand, Argentina, Costa Rica, Mexico, Belgium. So during the arrival orientation, you don't really do much except for playing ice-breaking games with them and just mingling around with Japanese people, practicing your Japanese. They also will have a little brief session 
where they brief you a little bit about AFS's rules, which I will get to later on in this video. Just a little heads up for you guys, alright? Um, be prepared to smile and nod a lot um, when you're in Japan because uh, you will not be able to understand anything they're saying when you first arrive. It's, yeah, it's just how, that's just how it is. Yeah. Alright, next. Meeting your host families. Before I get started with this one, I just want to say that you cannot choose your own host family because there's no because, you just can't choose it. I don't know what I'm saying. It's so hard. It's getting to me. You cannot choose your own host families. The company that you're going with, in my case it was AFS, they will allocate you to a host family that is compatible and suitable for you. So you cannot choose your host families at all. I initially, when I wanted Nah, screw my experience, but you can't do it. And also, all the host families who are with AFS, they are not paid to host you. So please be thankful for whatever that they're doing for you because they are not paid. They open up their homes and all because they want to learn more about you. A lot of you guys have been asking me this question. What do you call them? Do you call them mama or papa or dad, mom? Like, what do you call them? Some of them will prefer you call them okasan, which means mother, or otosan, which means dad. But there are other who would want you to call them by their name or just mama or papa. In my case, I had I had a couple of host families, I had three, and in my first host family, I called her Okasan and papa, of course. For my second and third host families, I called them by their names, so Oyasan or Furiasan. I recommend asking this question when you first meet them. So what do you call them when you first meet them? Well, you call them by, you take their family name and then you add the word son at the back. So that's what you call them first. And then ask them, like, how do you address them? For example, when you first meet them, like, if you want to say, you know, nice to meet you and all, Watanabe-san, hajimimashite. And um, just a tip for you guys, when you meet your host families, try to break the ice because if you are assigned to a host family who has never hosted that a student before they might be a little bit shy and awkward with you when they first meet so um, you know try your best to talk to them don't be afraid to use your Japanese even if it's broken how many host families will you have there's no saying that you will be with this family throughout the year because sometimes people change it depends on how how long a family wants to host you and no, you do not switch host schools just because you switch your host families. Next, household chores. In some families, yeah, you do get chores to do. Really simple ones like washing the dishes, putting, tidying up your room, which I, I, I failed. I failed. I was so bad at that. Tidying up shoes and all. And if you have little host siblings, you might need to take care of them. How does AFS choose your host families? People are always saying that like, ooh, your family is so cool, like, I want that sort of host family. Like, how can I ever get a host family like that? How, do, how does AFS choose host families? AFS chooses your host families based on your personality, so they will find a host family that, you know, is the best match for you, basically. So, like I mentioned previously, in the full application, when you have to state your preferences, you also have to state you know, what your personality is. Are you a quiet person? Are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? Ambivalent? And they will find a host family based on that. So, yeah. From my personality, I don't really need a lot of taking care of. I work well with a lot of older siblings or smaller families, I guess. In my first host family, I had two siblings, but they were all about the same age as me. Second host family, I had it was just my host mom and she's like a really young mom she's cool and my third family is just you know my grandma and two little baby boys but they don't really do anything to me yeah moving on host school so this is the same as your host families you're not allowed to choose you have absolutely no say no preference if you get a girl school you're in a girl school if you get a co-ed school, you're in a co-ed school, you're not allowed to switch schools or change schools. Don't even dream about it, girl. So a lot of you guys are very interested in how I managed to go into three schools at the same time while I was on exchange. Well, I was just really lucky, alright? So not everyone at all, actually, no one at all will ever have an experience like mine where I get to go through three different schools at the same time. So my schedule was from Monday to Wednesday I was in this school and Thursday I was in that school and Friday I was in another school. Initially AFS assigned me to Kiryu Joshikoko which was a 
girl school. So I was in a girl school, was kind of sad about it at first, but um, couldn't change it. But I was in the city of Kiryu, which was, it was known as the dying city. So there was not a lot of students in my school. And my school was about to close down, so it was about to be, you know, closed down until they merged with a boys school that was pretty close to my school called Kiritaka. When that boys school and my girl school merged, I was allowed to go to both schools because I was an exchange student. They allowed me to go to both schools. So I was in a boys school. Yes, I was. Because they were going to be one school anyways. So as an exchange student, I had sort of a leeway to be able to go to both schools. I was also in another school called Kyoai Gakuen. My host grandma used to be in that school and the principal of Kiru Joshi Koko was really really good friends with the principal of Kyoai Gakuen. So that was how I got into that school. So I've gotten a lot of um, messages from you guys asking me how I was able to go to all these different kind of schools because you guys want the same experience as me as well. And I, you can't, all right. You can't. Ha you can't get the same experience as me unless you're lucky enough to be put into a school that's about to close down and about to merge at the same time. All right. So putting that aside, let's move on to your first day of school. So now, people with stage fright might not like this, but you are required to do an opening speech. In some schools, you have to just do one in front of the entire school. In my school, in my case, if you go if you go to a smart school, you have to do two speeches, one in front of the teachers first, and then another one in front of the entire school. Now, you don't have to fret so much about you know doing speeches because honestly, you can just do a really simple one and get it done and over with, so. Something short and simple would do. Jap I suggest doing it actually in both Japanese and English. You can do the exact speech in English first and then in Japanese or vice versa. Or you can mix English and Japanese into one speech um, just to make it a little bit more casual. This is just my personal opinion but um, I think that first impression matters a lot. So um, if you are really uptight and serious with your speech, your schoolmates might be intimidated and they might be a little bit scared to come and approach you. And a lot of you guys after watching my a day in school with me or come to school with me video a lot of you guys are asking why um, the Japanese people in my video seem to be so happy and approach me they like a lot of them approach me and say hi to me first before I even talk to them honestly I think there's a reason for that it was because ever since the first day of school when I had my speech I was always talking in a really casual way I was not speaking formal Japanese at all I made my speech really 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 casual. It wasn't even like a speech honestly and I was just talking to the students. I was I cracked jokes during my speech and spoke in both English and Japanese so it was very chill and um, that helped a lot actually. I mean but that depends on what kind of exchange experience you want so. I have a little example of a short speech that you can do. You don't have to follow this. I didn't even use this speech but this is just an example and if you guys want to use it Go ahead and use it, alright? Alright, got my little notebook here. I've written a really short speech to help. Start your speech by saying Minasan konnichiwa. That basically means hello everyone. And after this you can say hajimemashite but you don't have to. I don't recommend it but you can say that if you want. Next, Jajan. Introduce yourself. So, watashi no namae wa yoriyasu desu. Yo de yonde kudasai. That means my name is blah blah blah, but you can call me blah blah blah. Oh yeah, by the way, if you're a boy, you don't say watashi, you say boku. So you will say boku no namae wa Benjamin des Ben de yonde kudasai. I apologize for my handwriting. I have really bad handwriting. And right after you introduce yourself, you can say your age, juha sai des, junana sai des, whatever. But I don't, I didn't say mine. Next, where do you come from? So you say your country name first and then you say Kara Kimashita. Kimashita. So it means I'm from whatever country. So if you're from England, you say Igirisu here. Igirisu Kara Kimashita. If you're from America, you can say America Kara Kimashita. You can tell them about your hobbies. Just something really simple. Watashi no, if you're a boy, use Boku. Watashi no Kyomi wa. Surfing to Joba desu. This is my own personal um, hobby. I, I like surfing and I also really like horseback riding. So Joba is horseback riding, so that's that. And I also did a lot of surfing when I was younger. Literal translation, it means my hobbies are what and what. So you can say, 私の趣味は 
ダンスとバドミントンです。My hobbies are dancing and badminton. That's that. And after that, you can say this one is optional, but I feel like it makes things more casual if you say this. So right after you say my hobbies are blah 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 blah. blah. 私の趣味はサーフィンと乗馬です。And then right after that, you say 最近何か何かも好きです。It means、um, recently I've also been into this activity. So for me that was karaoke. So karaoke. So in Japanese you don't call it karaoke. You call it karaoke. So you can say 最近 karaoke も好きです。Um, it sort of connects you with Japanese people and I think this is good. The, this is optional, of course. You don't need to use that. The next one, I feel like this, this one is pretty difficult because it's pretty long. But let's start off with Japanese. I know, like I said, again, if you're a boy, use boku. I know, Nihongo, Mada, Mijuku, Nano, de, Moshi, Machigate, Itara, Omen, Nasai. So it literally means, I know, my Nihongo Japanese, Mada, is still Mijuku, Nano, de, inexperienced, bad, or not so good yet. もし間違っていたら、so if there are any mistakes and all, ごめんなさい。Please forgive me. Please excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm gonna say it one more time. You can pause and slow down the video if you guys want to say it properly. 私の日本語まだ未熟なので、もし間違っていたらごめんなさい。You can't end off the speech right now, but this part again, it's optional for you to just throw in certain English casual phrases or casual sentences like. Please come and talk to me. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Stuff like that. I said that. Made a lot of people laugh, actually. Which is pretty good. It breaks the ice. So you can say that, or you can say, you know, I'm a really nice person. You know, just come up and talk to me. Give me a hug. I said that. I asked them to give me a hug, and they actually did come up to me, give me a hug. And always end off by saying, Dozo yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Which I'm not sure what it even means in English, because we don't even say that in English. I'm like, please take good care of me. You know, something like that.、Um, and of course, bow. Don't forget to bow. Next, do you get credits on a cultural exchange? The answer is no, you do not get credits at all. But at the end of the year, I think you can get like a,、um, a letter from the school if that helps. You can get the school to write a letter for you. Because you're an exchange student, you don't actually study, or even if you do study and take the exams, it will not be accounted for. So it's okay if you fail. And yes, all the tests and everything else is all in Japanese. Even their English exams are also in Japanese. What year will you be in? Well, most exchange students are usually placed in the first or the second year because the third years are studying for the exams, the university entrance exams, and you might be a hindrance to them. So most of the exchange students are in. 1年生 which is first year. I mean, 2年生 which is the second year. You guys are also asking about traveling, like how do you travel to school and all. You are expected to memorize the route to school on the day that you go down with your host family to meet your school principal. That's before the first day of school. So you are expected to memorize, and it's usually not that. Difficult. Most exchange students don't really travel that much. They go like 40 minutes by bike. But I was unlucky, of course, and I had to travel a really long way. I had to take, I had to walk for 30 minutes through this farm and then <laughs> take a train for 20 minutes and then walk to the bus stop for 5 minutes and then take a bus to my school for another 30 minutes. So, next. Tips on making friends. Now, I have three personal tips for making friends with Japanese people mostly. My first tip is actually to just go around your school and just say hi. Do it in English. Just go up to them and say hi and just stretch out your hand. Try to shake their hand. They will get intimidated at first, but. In a good way, so and it breaks the ice immediately once you do that. The second way of making friends is just to ask, Do you have a boyfriend or do you have a girlfriend? I don't know why, but it works. It's super effective. You can do it in both English and Japanese. Like, Japanese people will always say, Oh, I can't speak English and all. But if you ask them, Do you have a boyfriend or do you have a girlfriend in English? They seem to understand that for some odd reason, but yeah, it works all the time. And my last tip is actually, Don't be afraid to touch them. Especially the boys. My Japanese guy friends are a lot more open with me than they are with Japanese girls. When you take a group picture and all, please make them put their arms around each other because it's just so awkward. And, and you know, it, it's just so awkward to take a picture without, with, you know, not touching each other, just putting your hands here. It's just so weird. Even for friends, they don't do that. So please do that. Make them do that. 
it doesn't matter it makes the picture nicer yeah and they will be like oh my god like what's this when you ask them to do it but it breaks the eyes and in the end it's good it, it works all right next this is mostly for the girls out there you don't want to say it but your time of the month basically so first off the word for period in japanese is seiri so please remember that um, if you have any problems just ask your house mother she will help you and the word for sanitary pads is called nakukin nakukin if you are a tampon girl, bring your own tampons because they don't use a lot of tampons in Japan. They don't really have a lot of tampons in Japan. Fun fact, most high school girls in Japan don't even know what a tampon is. And also for girls out there, if you stain your undies, please wash them first before, you know, hand wash them first before tossing them into the wash. Thank you. Alright, we're moving on to Wi-Fi and a phone. Sorry about the background noise. Someone's taking a shower next door. So if you're going with AFS, AFS will provide you with a flip phone which is to me completely useless because I need the Wi-Fi and I barely even touched the um, the phone that AFS gave me so that's good um, if you have an emergency and contrary to popular beliefs that Japanese people only use flip phones that's like completely false maybe for the older generations but all of my friends in high school every one of them had an iPhone 7 so yeah Alright, so if you're like me and you need the internet because you upload YouTube videos, then I suggest personally getting a portable Wi-Fi or a pocket Wi-Fi so you can have Wi-Fi wherever you go. So I have an uncle who lives in Japan, so I had him get that for me and also get a phone for me. So I was using a Japanese number. Some families do not have Wi-Fi and that that's just a big problem for me because I upload videos on YouTube and I need Wi-Fi. In order to upload a video on YouTube, I need really strong Wi-Fi connection. So I personally suggest getting a pocket Wi-Fi. It's not that expensive, I think it's pretty cheap. Or you can stay for like hours in 7-Eleven just to get free Wi-Fi. It works that way as well. Next, culture shock. I'm not gonna tell you what kind of culture shocks they are because it, uh, it, it's different for everyone so but I am gonna tell you how to deal with it because a lot of people get angry when they realize that you know things are different so how do you deal with this so really just don't be afraid of letting new information into your mind because you know, don't get mad just because um, just because it's different from what you expected try to embrace the fact that whatever you're experiencing is the real Japan is the actual Japan and it might be really hard but try to let go of that initial image you had of Japan and once you start to do that and once you start to understand that you will start to realize that there's just so much more for you to learn and for you to discover like a whole new culture that you never even knew existed all right guys we're moving on to the last part of this video AFS rules now there are a lot of different rules in AFS but they never talk about their rules on their website but today I'm gonna to be telling you just some of the um, some of the rules that they have in AFS that they don't really tell the exchange students they don't really put it out there so today I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about them they have a lot of different rules of course when you sign up with AFS you will get this huge thick booklet um, just talking about all the rules but those are kind of like minor rules and they have five really big major rules that you have to follow have to have to follow so the first one is no hitchhiking no adulteries, no getting yourself into relationships at all. Number three, no meeting your actual parents during your exchange year. So you're not allowed to meet your actual parents at all. Number four, no leaving your chapter. So if you're in Gunma, you're not allowed to go to Tokyo. If you're in Tokyo, you're not allowed to go anywhere else. So you're not allowed to leave your chapter without permission. And the last and final major rule that they have in AFS is of course no drinking and no smoking. And that kind of sucks because in my country, the legal age to drink um, is 18 and it just sucks to you know go back to being a minor again in Japan because in Japan um, you have to be 21 I think or 20 to be able to drink so yes those are the basic uh, the major rules of AFS and what happens when you break the rules if you get caught breaking the rules of course you will be sent back home early you don't want to be sent back home early because that's a waste of your money of course you paid so much for your exchange program just to be sent home early that's bullshit right that's complete crap so can you break the rules of course you can you know but um, do it at your own risk do you know what I'm saying? I've broken about four of the rules. Everything actually except for the adulteries one. And I don't regret breaking the rules at all. In fact, it made my exchange more worthwhile. I feel I learned a lot more. Now I don't condone breaking the rules and all, but if breaking the rules is gonna help 
make your exchange a better experience for you then I'd say go ahead and do it because this is your exchange you know you paid for that shit so go ahead and do it anyways just try not to get caught and you know plan things out ahead and don't blame me if you get caught all right I had like really supportive host families and who hated AFS for some odd reason as well so they were all right with me they were okay with me breaking the rules as long as I take care of myself so I had really I was just lucky enough to get really chill host families because most of them like puns um, his host family would just report back to AFS so but I was just good enough to get host families who were you know willing to break the rules with me so and yeah I think that's pretty much it about exchange I don't know but my brain's not working right now and I feel like I missed out quite a lot of things so um, if you guys have any other questions please leave them down in the comment section below I will try my best to reply to the comments but um, I will only be replying to the ones that I feel are relevant to going on exchange. I will not be answering any sort of personal questions about myself because this video is about exchange. I don't want to talk about myself, alright? So yeah, that's all for today. I'll see you guys next time. Bye!